And I'm going to hand back to John Lee to then take us through the evening. And uh, welcome, John Lee. And uh, tell us why you're passionate about this. And let's take it from there. Sure, thanks so much. So, um, hi everyone, my name is John Lee, and I actually work for a company called Capital Legacy. And why we're so um, passionate about what we do is very much hand in hand with what Jasper and their company does for you guys. It's about leaving a legacy for the people that we love the most and so that we actually have a better story to tell once we actually no longer hear. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you a little bit about, I'm going to take you through a presentation where I'm going to explain a little bit about a will. Um, we will have a Q&A session afterwards. So let me run through everything and then we can go back and forth as much as you guys need. So I'm going to just share my screen with everyone. I'm sure you all can see it. Yes, we can. And I'm going to jump right into it. Yes, right? So, perfect. Thanks so much for the confirmation. So what is a will, right? So many people are a little bit hesitant to talk about what happens when we actually die, right? But there's, there's a lot more to it when we actually pass away than just grieving our loved ones. And so the initial point of a will is to actually express to our family what we want to be happen to our estate, what we want to happen to our body. And there are a little bit more intense things in terms of the nitty about executorship. And these are all words that I'm going to explain in the coming slides. But let's focus on this one for first. So what is a will? So number one, it is a legal binding document, right? It expresses your wishes when you pass away. Wishes, I'm talking about stuff like, I, for instance, I myself am married with a five-year-old and I would like everything to go to my husband. Should my husband and I pass away, for instance, in the same car accident, we would then want our daughter to inherit. So it sets out who is going to inherit assets when we pass away. It also states certain specific things, for instance, like say, for instance, I was blessed to have a beautiful porchy painting, for instance, and I wanted that to go to a specific person in my family. It's, it's, it's a specific wish that I'm going to then state in this legal document. We then talk about nominating an executor. So in our world, we use this fancy word called an executor. And what the executor actually does is the person that is going to administer our state. They're the person, the admin around wrapping out our estate. They're the ones that talk to the bank. They're the ones that talk to SARS. They settle our house stuff, our debt, stuff like that. So that's the actual admin person. And that person is nominated in our will as an executor. So many people are not sure why we need an executor, for instance. So there's a law in our country that if you're a state, so everything I own is, for instance, over 250,000 rand, which these days seems to be a car, then by law, I have to have a nominated executor to do that. I'm going to touch a little bit more on that in um, the next few slides, but that's, I just want you to understand that that's what an executor is, right? Uh, as I mentioned, I am a mom to a five-year-old. So in my will, I'm also going to nominate a guardian. Um, a guardian is somebody that's then going to take my place as a parent. So not necessarily the bank accounts and stuff like that. That we refer to as a testamentary trust, but the person that my kid is actually going to go live with. Um, that's then nominated in my actual will as well. So it's given me a legal document that is somewhat bounding. There's certain parts of it that aren't bounding that are more of last wishes. And my family will always try to honor, but there's other parts in it that by, by law, we then need to follow. When we talk about a testamentary trust, another law in our country, under 18, you can't inherit in our country. So if I, for instance, in my example, would say that I leave everything directly to my daughter and I don't put it into trust to her, it's going to end up in the government guardian fund, right? So that's in essence, just what is a will, okay? Let's talk a little bit about what happens when we actually die without a will. So if we don't have a will, we then follow the law that's called Inter Interstate Succession Act, right? And this means that it will go down the actual family tree. Because I didn't have this document, I didn't nominate my own executor, for instance. And now the court will then be able to nominate my executor, my trustee. They're going to look at any guardians that they think might be fit. Your state will be dealt with according to rigid and inflexible laws. So like we said, that this is now dying without a will. So it's going to now follow my family tree. Say, for instance, that I wasn't married, right? And I am a single mom and I have a little one. Now my family tree is to my little one. Say I wasn't a 
um, a mom at all, it was just me. Now it's going to go backwards to my parents. But say for instance, I didn't have a good relationship with my friends. It's actually, I never wanted them to inherit from me. But because I didn't have a will that stated where I wanted my estate to go, we now have to follow this act. And that's what we mean by it to be rigid and inflexible. Okay, we've already spoken a little bit about the children's inheritance. So again, if I leave it directly to my daughter and she isn't an 18 year old, so she's seen as a minor, it's going to go to the government guardian fund. And I'm pretty sure we're all on the same page when we, yeah, we have to deal with anything that's related to the government. There's a lot of corruption and fraud that's happening in that actual fund that we unfortunately have no control over. So let's talk about 10 important things about your will. So the original and signed will is valid. What we mean by this is when we sign our wills, we have to have two independent witnesses sign a will. Um, that's the first thing. Second thing, it's not about just having to write on a napkin, I leave everything for you, and this now has to stand in court. It has to be a legal binding document with the correct clauses. Spoke a little bit about an executor. You were points of a friend or family member as an executor may be declined by the master. So we still actually very much dictated by the law in our country when it comes to executorships. And there's only three types of people that could actually do this actual administration. And those three things are banks, attorneys, and fiduciary houses. So fiduciary house is just a fancy word for estate administration. That's something that capital legacy is. So although I feel that my brother who is a mechanic is really, really good with money, he's going to be fine, he's going to know what to do, he'll get it. I can appoint him, but when it comes to my death and we're sitting in front of the master to get our stamps to start the administration in order to now start distribution of inheritance, they're going to tell me, show me your qualifications. And if he cannot provide that, they will then appoint an executor. So now I'm, I've kind of left my family in a little bit of a tough spot because who knows who they're going to choose. They're probably going to choose their mates, which means they're going to then charge the maximum fees. Your will only deals with life cover that pays into your estate, and thus the will and life cover beneficiary nominations must complement each other. So many of us have, we have a will and we say we leave everything to whoever, and then we have life cover which has a completely different beneficiary. Those two things run completely separate. They are actually governed by two different laws in our country, and that's why we're saying they need to complement each other. If I say my will, my husband gets everything, and Side notes, I'm gonna put my husband in a terrible light. He's a very good human. But say for instance, I had a little sticky on the side and my life cover is paying out to him. My will has no say over that life cover that's going to pay to somebody else. And so we're saying let's rather seamlessly integrate these two, let them complement, speak to one another to make that estate administration easier as well as quicker for your family. Number four, we spoke, we do not create a testament to trust for minor, and therefore it goes to the government guardian fund and property is held in the name of the guardian. So although I might choose my sister to look after my child, my goal is in, in to actually make sure that my daughter is then sorted and she will then have an estate and a legacy that she can then take forward. So if I don't want to jeopardize that in any way, I'm going to put it all into trust for her. Guardian nominations, very important points about guardian nomination is that although we're putting this in a legal document, it is still a last wish. If I nominate somebody and at that point of time they are not found fit by the court to look after my kid, they will then look into the family or get a family advocate involved to rather actually consider somebody else. But by me putting it in my will, I already giving the master as well as the family advocate some sort of direction of who I would want to actually look after my daughter. Okay, we can also put failing options. So I could say, I'm leaving my daughter, I'd like my sister to be the guardian of uh, my daughter, but failing my sister at that point, please can my mom be? And that's an important thing because it's giving guideline and we don't have to look too far. Another point on the guardian nomination is that, um, again, I'm going to put my husband in terrible light, but say he was a no good deep, dead deep dad, right? And he knows this kid exists and he's just never, ever been part of her life he still has a legal right over my daughter. So although I put in my guardian nominations, my sister, um, he still has a right as the natural guardian of that child. Should I for any other reason be able to beforehand prove that he is not fit? So 
say I have a restraining order against them or we have um, some sort of police clearances or declarations, I will then attach those type of evidence to my guardian and uh, to my will so that my guardian nomination in my will could then at least be taken into consideration. So again, although this is in a legal binding document, it's still very much a last wish that we will try and honor. Okay, important that the guardian should know that they nominate it. So have those conversations with the people that you're putting in the world to say, should something happen, please know they, they will come knock on your door. Um, we've had very sad cases where people have been nominated as guardians, but had no idea. Um, it was never discussed with them and they actually don't want to ever be that. So it's not just a novelty badge that we're giving somebody as making them our guardians. Um, it's something that is very much a very serious conversation and could very much be a reality without us knowing. Important, you cannot inherit with debt and taxes and marital claims are always settled first. So if I was married in community of property, that means 50-50 no matter what, um, that will first be seen. So in my will, if I was married in community of property, I only have a say over my 50%. I don't have to, by no means, give my 50% to my husband. I can distribute it exactly how I want, but it will be adhered to first. So although I say that the house and everything needs to be given to this person, I will, in this example, as in married in community of property, only be talking about my 50% that I withhold in that property to be given to somebody. You can use a will to document your last wishes, but these are only wishes and may not be enforceable. What I'm referring to in this section, and we're at point number eight, is stuff like I would like to be buried at the foot of Table Mountain in a pink coffin and I want white tulips on my grave, for instance, right? It's very much a last wish that my family would like to honor, but I can't force them to put me at the Table Mountain because there are certain rules involved in stuff like that. Um, other things that fall under last wishes would be certain specific things that I'd like to leave. So remember I previously spoke about a portrait painting, for instance, I would like my mom to inherit that. That's something I'm going to put in there um, as a last wish. Do I want to be buried, cremated? If I want to be donated to science, for instance, those are things that we refer to as last wishes. So they may not be necessarily enforceable, but they definitely in my will as a consideration. If you state that you would like to be an organ donor in your will, Although you can still register, we have got a partnership with the Organ Donor um, Society, and so we can register you in the very same breath. Many people don't know this necessarily, but if you are an organ donor in our country, um, you can't be buried, you'll be cremated. So that's just something to take in consideration when wanting to be an organ donor. I also can't be a selective organ donor. I can't say that, yes, I wanna be an organ donor, but you know what, please don't use my eyes, they're the windows to my soul, it's all in all out basis. They'll take what they need at that point. And it's actually registered on your ID number. Then the last point is that you cannot cater for every eventuality. It's best to keep it simple and up to date as your circumstances change. Circumstances change, we meaning uh, my guardian might have passed away. I need to nominate a new one. Um, I've gotten divorced. I got a new child. Those are things that we need to then update the world with. When we also talk about we cannot cater for every eventuality is that I cannot rule from the grave. Um, although I want my daughter to be this very successful doctor in my life, I cannot dictate her future. And so therefore, when I say that she inherits and I give her that inheritance, I've got no say over it, or I can't put limitations on it. I can't say she can only inherit at age 25 if she's completed her doctor's degree, for instance. I, I cannot cater for the eventuality. I don't know what will happen. Should I not be here? Should she maybe not even be anymore? It's, it's best just to keep it simple to say, I'm giving it to you and I'm hoping that you do the best with it. So it's important to note that we cannot rule from the grave, although we really want to. Many times I get asked this question very often to say that, no, I'm, you know, I'm 21. I don't, why should I really draft a will? I don't really have much. Um, remember, there's other things that we state in the world. We're stating what I want to do with my body. I, my family might be grieving at this point and not really know that I wanted to be buried at Table Mountain's foot, for instance. And this gives them some sort of guideline. 
So even with little or no assets, when we require a house or car, anything that changes, we need to then update our testament, right? It's often too late and our families are left with lengthy administration and financial burden of getting experts involved to wrap up the loose ends. And that's why we should do a will. How often we should amend it, as often as your circumstances change, it's best to review it should nothing really change, just really just make sure everything's in place, you're happy with the spelling, you're happy with what's happening, things happen. Um, unfortunately, this is a, a very somber conversation, but it, it, we lose people all the time and it's the, the point of this is to lessen that burden for our family should we actually pass away and that's what we mean by leaving a legacy um it's you know that after life that i still kind of looked out for my family made sure they knew where to go just an important note a will is not cancelled by divorce or remarriage it must be changed within three months of divorce or your ex will inherit this is something we deal with on a daily basis where people feel that, yeah, but they got divorced, so that contract is done. It's not the same thing. Um, remember, they run separately, okay? So just to wrap it up, the no will, the reality of not having a will is that you won't be around, but your loved ones will feel financial stress and strain, right? There are fees that, and costs that are involved in wrapping up an estate, regardless of whether you're with us, a bank or attorney, um, our families have to pay for these. It has to come out of our estate. If our estate doesn't have the liquidity, we have to sell assets. And it's, it's the point of it is that we don't want to do any of that. And although life goes on and the list carries on, it's important that we do this Check it periodically, make sure everything is in place. It's peace of mind for you and it's peace of mind for your family. So you've heard me talk a few times about actual fees and financial burden for your family. Um, these are the three main ones that come into play when we actually pass away. So we've spoken a lot about the executive fee. What you see on the screen now is the maximum in the industry that any executor can charge you. And that is the 4.01% inclusive of VAT on your gross estate. Okay. When I mentioned inheritance for my daughter, I said that I want to avoid the government guardian fund. Therefore, I'm going to put it into trust. These are the trust fees per annum. And conveyancing fee is just another fancy word for transferring a property. So my husband and I own our home together. Um, regardless of our marital regime, that if one of us passed away, we'd obviously want the other one to inherit the asset. We wouldn't want to sell it. We still have to transfer that entire property into the other person's name. So we go through exactly the same process as we did when we bought it. And those are fees involved, right? So these are the three main fees that come into play um, when we actually pass away. And that's my actual story, guys. So I just wanted to really share with you what is in a will what happens without it, what happens um, in it, what do we put in it. And so now I'm open for any and all questions.